and welcome back to Reflect Forward. I'm your host, Carrie Siggins, and I am so happy you are here today. Uh, my guest today is my good friend, Amy Parsons. She's the CEO and co-founder of Maza Fiata. It's an e-commerce uh, direct-to-consumer business that imports Italian luxury brands in beauty and men's grooming and sells them across the United States. Amy launched Mazza Fiato during the middle of the pandemic in 2020, leaving a 20-year career as an attorney and a university executive to focus exclusively on starting the company. Today, one year into running Mazza Fiato, the company represents 20 different heritage brands, which she tells us all about, selling approximately 1,000 products on its site, and it has been featured in Vogue, Travel and Leisure, The Rob Report, among others and is quickly working to scale to be an industry leader in the beauty and grooming industry. Amy also is in YPO. Uh, she was in my Colorado chapter now in Global One. So I've gotten to know her over the years and she is truly one of the most thoughtful people I've ever met. I love her insight. She's present in the moment. She always gives great feedback. She notices what's going on because when you're talking to her, she's just right there paying attention to what you're saying, listening and engaging with you every step of the way. And I just absolutely adore her. I've been so excited for her as she has began this new adventure of running a startup and growing a luxury brand. She is passionate about Italy and Italian products, and that comes through in everything that she does. Anyway, you're just going to love this interview. We talk about what it was like to make a dramatic career change, leaving Colorado State University and doing the startup with Mazza Fiato and how her views on leadership has changed and building a team and what she tolerates and what she doesn't tolerate. It's so much fun. So hang tight and I'll be right back with Amy. All right, I'm back everyone with the beautiful and amazing and my good friend, Amy Parsons. Amy, thanks for joining me on the show today. Thanks for having me, Carrie. I just want to say before you get started, it's really just always such a privilege to share space with you. You're a leader that I really admire and have for a long time, and especially your honesty and your own journey. And it's been amazing to me to hear you tell your story um, so honestly, and it's always been an inspiration. So I appreciate you having me on your show. I always learn so much from you. No, thanks. I feel the same about you. And I can't wait for you to share more of your story because it's such an interesting one. Uh, and of course, I was, uh, you know, there through part of it as you were figuring out what you wanted to do with your life uh, as you were talking about a big <laughs> career shift. So I'd like to start with that. So you made a 180 degree career shift uh, in this past year and a half. And I know it takes a ton of courage to walk away from a 20-year career as an attorney and as an executive at Colorado State University. So tell us that story. Why did you leave and and go launch Mazia Fado? Yeah, thanks. And I, I, I do recall, Carrie, that you were there for a few of my tears during that transition. So yeah. thank you again for being there <laughs> through that time in my life. And you're right. I think objectively, it does look like a 180 degree turn from being a, you know 20 years in law and as an executive in a university system to launching a startup Italian beauty company that does, those two things sound so completely opposite, but and and objectively, they really are. But I think with any major transition like that, there's always some seeds of it back there. It's never just a cold sort of transition to it. And I think looking back in those 20 years, some of those seeds for me were that what I learned I love to do is to build things from scratch. And when I was chief operating officer for CSU, I got to build a new football stadium, for example, and seeing it going from the idea around a table of maybe we should build a football stadium on the campus. Fast forward a few years to game day and watching kickoff in the stadium. That's very satisfying. It's a lot of hard work, but I love that idea of setting the vision, a big vision for something that you want to do, and then just working it every single day, day in and day out until those two things come together and you see your vision come to life. And I was fortunate that I was able to do that a few times at CSU, build a campus in Mexico and, and things like that. And I learned that 
that's what I really love is taking a new concept, something that's never existed before and just force it all the way into um, existing in the world. So I loved being able to do that and started to sort of think that's what I really love to do. That's what I want to do. There's not enough of that in that job, but I got to do it enough times to really realize that I love making those types of things happen. I think another seed was when when I was on my commute into work every day and I'm listening to podcasts like I do all the time, I wasn't listening to podcasts about the law or higher ed. I was listening to podcasts about the beauty industry and what was going on in there. And it was fascinating to me and the new developments and all these things. So that was sort of a clue to me that that's really where my interests are is what I'm just listening to in my own time on my commutes back and forth to work. And also I just, I learned to love Italy over the years too and travel and I love travel and love finding things in Europe and finding things in Italy and that craftsmanship. And so all those seeds really started coming together for me in different ways over time. And um, it really was the COVID push of being physically home all of a sudden for the first time in 20 years and, and giving me that, that kind of space from my career physically and mentally and opening up that time when I could really start to think about what would something else look like for me and to bring all these threads of it together. And to be honest, if we didn't have COVID, if I was still just barreling down the road and that career same every day, I probably never would have made the leap. Yeah. So how did you get over the fear? Because I'm sure there was uh, a lot of questioning and self-doubt, you know, leaving this really stable job, stable place that I'm at to go launch a startup. So how did you go through that process? There always is fear in making a big transition. I think for me, I really started to think about there's no completely safe or risk-free option. There is a risk if I make the leap and create a new company and go do a startup. There's a risk if I don't. There's a risk to complacency. There's a risk to staying put and continuing to do the same thing that you're doing all the time. And I think in my mind, eventually, it just started to flip that it felt like a bigger risk to me to stay than to leave and that there's risks on both sides. There's never, there's never an option that's just like, that's completely safe, right? Um, there's a risk in everything. And, and I think there's a risk in being complacent and staying put and that you'll never really know what it would have been like if you would have tried. Um, you would have ended your career and looked back and say, did I really make the impact that I wanted to make? Um, did I really put my own identity into this and know who I was? And that started to weigh on me as actually a bigger risk. So I became more fearful about staying than going. Um, and I think flipping that fear in your head is where you kind of have to be to feel okay about doing it. Yeah, that's a beautiful answer and so true. And have you ever done anything like this before in your life? No, Carrie, I, I was one of these um, people who, you know, I thought early on I was going to be an attorney and I went straight through college, right into law school, right into the big firm, right into being in-house legal counsel, right in like, no, I never did anything risky from a career standpoint. I just continued on my path all the way. And I think that's a pretty typical story, um, especially of a lot of women. I mean, this is a career I supported my family with it. It was a great stabilizing force for my home life. And it was really sort of just meeting everybody else's expectations, which I sort of somehow thought were my own expectations, but really were everybody else's expectations of what I ought to be doing. And it, it takes a long time to figure out of how much of this did I actually choose versus was kind of chosen for me and I was just going down that path. So no, never, never did anything like it before. And so what have you learned about yourself as you've made this leap and, and broke free from other people's expectations? Like, what are you doing differently? That's, that's a really good question. Um, I think a lot of what I'm doing differently is moving at my own pace and figuring out what that pace is. When you do a startup, it's a very fast pace. 
but you're the one making the decisions and you're the one who can pivot away quickly from bad decisions and do different things. So it's realizing every day that I'm setting the pace of what we're doing um, and living with those decisions, the good decisions and the bad decisions. It's that feeling of extreme ownership, if you will. I know there's that book, Extreme Ownership, of everything that happens in the day, there is no one else to look at but you uh, for if it goes well or if it's a disaster. It's on you um, and you just have to own it every single day. It's a good feeling, but it can also be a, a terrifying feeling when you wake up in the morning. Yeah, no, I, I completely understand. Uh, that's one of my favorite books. I've had all of my executive team read it because I believe yeah. in that same way, right? There's no bad teams, only bad leaders. And 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 I yep. take that very seriously because you're right, as a leader in any organization, you're certainly setting the vision, setting the strategy, setting the pace, and you're either going to inspire people to come along on the ride with you or you know, burn out and break down. <laughs> <laughs> You're out there on your own. <laughs> Which is not a way to lead. <laughs> yeah. All right. So tell us a little bit about Maza Fiato. Like what exactly is it that you do? So we're an e-commerce business. We're in the retail space. We're in the beauty and men's grooming category. So we are Kind of an all Italian Sephora, if you will. We're representing 20 different Italian companies, uh, all heritage craft companies from all over the country of Italy. We're buying directly from them, importing into the US, into our warehouse, which is in Pennsylvania, and selling on our e commerce site. And really, our mission for this is to connect people back to what's beautiful about. The beauty industry and about these beauty and men's grooming products and to reconnect people with the people who make the products and the regions that they're coming from and that tradition and craft behind it. I think in the U.S., the beauty industry is so massive. It's so dominated by these giant beauty retailers that when you go in those stores, it's overwhelming in terms of products and new launches and trends and influencers and celebrities and everybody backing these lines that it's really lost on the shelf of who's behind these products and the craftsmanship and the tradition. So we're trying to kind of swing the pendulum back toward that, toward companies where you can actually go to Italy and walk in their store and meet them. That just happened to me a, a week ago. My friend Abby got married and went on her honeymoon in Italy and she sends me a text and she's like, I found this product, you know, on the island that's really here. And I love that, that people can discover the products and actually travel to Italy and meet the families who, who make them. So that's what we're trying to do. Have beauty be a beautiful experience of connection to place and to family and to support these amazing Italian heritage brands that we're representing and bringing to new audiences. And so how do you determine what brands you're going to represent? Like, what does heritage look like for, for you? Yeah, I mean, we really look at the brands that we represent through a few different lenses. We're looking for brands that are authentically Italian, that have great stories behind them. Some of these brands are 400 years old. Some of these brands are a decade old, but we're looking for authenticity. And we're looking for really great, high-quality performance in the products, whether it's men's shaving or it's hand soap or it's skincare. We're looking for the best products out there in terms of performance and quality. And then we're looking for just great style. I mean, the Italians and, and how they package their products and how they smell. And I mean, they're just extreme in their style, how great they are. So we're looking for that great style, great stories and really high performance. So and there's, there's a lot of them. I think you probably know, Carrie, I mean, Italy makes the world's cosmetics and beauty products, like luxury brands from the US and Europe. They all go to Italy to make their stuff because they've got the craftsmanship and that generational know-how, how to, how to make these products. But the secret in all of it is that there's all these homegrown Italian brands in the country making it for themselves, families making it for themselves that are relatively unknown outside of Italy and outside of Europe. And those are the brands that we're going after, the homegrown Italian brands and bringing them out and selling them in the U.S. to new audiences. 
it's clear through your story, uh, through your brand story and your marketing story. I've watched, you know, since the very beginning as you've gotten started with it and, and, and seen how, how you really are bringing a lot of those stories to life through, through your marketing campaigns and, and through that branding. And it has a little bit of edginess, which I really appreciate. You can see like the old style Italy and then you know, the, the edginess of the product. And, and so I think um, you're doing a really good job of, of separating yourself from the other types of brands that are out there by bringing that story to life through your marketing. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. That's the toughest thing about the business is just getting visibility and differentiating yourself in the market. Um, and then what we're finding luckily is when people do find us, and they buy, then they come back. Then that's their place to go. Go for gifts, go for themselves, go for their spouses. Um, so it really is all about discovery and why we're different and bringing them in in the first place. And that's that's a huge challenge for any startup and any e-commerce business. And that's really what we're up against and trying to tell that story every day. Yeah, yeah. So what's been the most surprising thing as you've gone from, you know, university life to a uh, startup Italian luxury brand. <laughs> Man, so much. I would say though, I mean, something that's really stark, like every single day is, you know, when you're running a massive organization, like a university and you have 10,000 employees and huge budgets and you're, you're planning at scale of two, three fiscal years down the road and long-term contracts and all of this stuff. And now e-commerce startup, I mean, it is literally every single day, you know how you're doing, <laughs> you know, yeah. if you're, how many people are showing up to your website, how many people are buying your stuff, you know, exactly what is happening day by day. And it's, it's kind of hard to see past the end of the week. You know, you are so in the right now, money in, money out, what's happening. All the numbers are right there in front of you. There's no hiding the ball. There's no long-term planning for anything. It's really just being that everyday nimble what's happening here and now. So going from all of that to literally what's happening right now on the website is it's great. But what I've, I've learned that I need to do is my mood and how I feel tends to go up and down with how we're doing on any given day. And you can't live like that. That's where burnout happens of feeling like, we're doing great. And then the next day, like, what the hell is going on? You got to learn to level it out. And I'm still learning how to do that. Uh, being more even keel, you can't tell the whole story on any one day or one week or one month and stepping back and taking that much bigger view. So um, that's just that's just a huge difference. And, and the pace at which we... Um, make decisions and bring on new teams and change courses is lightning speed compared to what you're able to do when you're running an organization as massive as a, as a university system. So yeah, very, very different. It could not be more different. <laughs> <laughs> so what lessons have you learned in those previous 20 years that are worth keeping uh, as you are now running a startup and what are worth letting go? Uh, you know, I think probably every lesson that you learn is worth worth keeping in some way. You know, the lessons that you learn early on in your career. When I was an attorney in private practice, I remember the managing attorney of the litigation department basically said to me, and I'm sure he said it much more eloquently, but it was, you know, you're only going to succeed here when you realize how hard the job is. Mm -hmm. Like there's no skating. There's no shortcuts. You have to know how hard this job is and appreciate that and live up to that every day if you're going to succeed here. Like no stone unturned. You know everything when you walk into that courtroom or file that brief. Like there are no shortcuts in that job. And I, that was a valuable lesson to learn as just a brand new baby lawyer of you have to have the goods. You really have to know it every day. And I've carried that through all the way until now that you really have to know what you're doing um, and really understand how hard the job is. I think, you know, one lesson that I learned that is much more acute now that it's a much smaller team is sort of the no, I won't swear on your podcast, but the no jerk rule is real. And when you're in a big organization, there's going to be those people 
who are really difficult and have a negative impact on culture. And, you know, I've been in, in our previous system where sometimes the philosophy was that person provides a really valuable talent to the organization. So we all just have to put up with it because we need that talent. And I learned over the years that it's never worth it. It's never worth it to keep that person on the team, no matter what you think that they're providing from a talent standpoint, it's always going to be the poison that takes down the team. It's just a matter of how long. So you can find other talent that's not a jerk. Um, and it's hard to do in big organizations. Here, now that I'm running a small organization and we're a scrappy startup, if you bring in somebody who doesn't fit with that culture and who is going to be a jerk, it'll sink our ship super fast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being really slow to determine who gets to be on our team and who's going to work here and really setting that standard for culture, calling it out immediately if it starts to go sideways, because there can just be no room for error in culture um, in an organization that's this small and hopefully will be a big organization someday. So setting that standard now and really just being brutally honest about it with everybody, I think is the only way that we can go. Cause I've, I've just seen it play out and I'm sure you have to carry that. Um, it just cannot be tolerated in an organization. It's always a poison. No, nope. what you tolerate becomes what's accepted. And, and I completely agree. We have a no a-hole rules our, ourselves at Stone Age. And we actually really call, we call it as a to toxic high performer. <clears throat> and yeah. we actually label that. And we will have conversations with people who are showing up in a really negative way and, and say, you're a high performer, but you're toxic. And toxic high performers don't make it here because our core values right. are being a great teammate, which means, you know, humility and self-leadership and relationship building and motivation to be part of the culture. And so I think you're spot on. We set that tone a long time ago. And as we've scaled as an organization, it's been a lot easier to have those conversations rather than trying to change, you know, what has become right. tolerated for and accepted for decades. Yep. That's absolutely right, Carrie. I mean, it's, it's having that foresight now as we're young and small group of exactly what we're going to tolerate um, because that is what we're going to become. And we want the absolute best people, best talented people yeah. working here. And there just can be absolutely no room for that. No yeah. room for error, right? In hiring and culture, just we can't afford it. And I think it goes back to that, that statement that the, the you know your mentor your lawyer mentor talked to you about where you have to be really good at what you do which I completely agree all of those other things that that come the soft skills which I think they're now they're calling power skills are so important <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you lose credibility if you don't know what you're doing your know, competency matters but I think a lot of people have just put so much emphasis on the competency part. And those soft mm -hmm. skills, you know, that's for, you know, for HR or, or more of those soft type roles. And it's just not true. I think, especially seeing where we are with all the changes that are happening with the pandemic, with people saying, I want to be respected at my work and I want to have purpose in my job. And I want to have a boss who cares about me and who's empathetic, right? You have to use those now power skills and pair competency with it, not just show up with one or the other. And that's how right. I think leaders are going to have to start looking at their businesses. I think you're right. And, and really teaching those power skills of shining a light when somebody is exhibiting bad behavior, yeah. that's going to be toxic to the culture and not letting it go and yeah. empowering people to say, Hey, that's not okay. We yeah. don't do that here. Yeah. That's hard. That yeah. can be really hard for a team to do. And um, you know, in my previous role, I told all my team members that there's zero tolerance for that. And if they witness it and don't feel like they can be the ones to raise the flag and step in and call on it, doing nothing is not an option. They have to come to me so I can do it. Mm -hmm. um, but they can't see it and not act. Yep. Right. They at least have to come to me so that I can act on it. And, yep. and yeah, now starting a brand new company, starting from scratch, that's got to be absolutely crystal clear, right? Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, I'm working with my employees a lot on this too. We have a keep it real as part of our self-leadership culture. And uh, and so we're really trying to teach people how to be able to keep it real and and show up with that empathy. Right? We're all going through so much and it's so easy to assume like, oh, that person is this, 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 and this. And we don't really always understand, right? So a culture of accountability and feedback can still be a culture of kindness and, and compassion and caring mm -hmm. and saying, look, this is not okay. This behavior isn't working but let me understand what's going on with you. And so rather than it just be, you know, me as the CEO of the company or the executive management team or the, the managers within the company, I want to teach peers to be able to have those conversations. Like, hey, wow, you know, it's really hard to talk to you right now. You are super grumpy uh, and it's affecting things. Like what is going on to see if we can create the type of environment where everybody feels safe to be able to call each other out on it, but also do it in a way that you're seeking to understand and be supportive of people. And that's a hard thing yeah. to create right there because it's scary. It's a hard thing to create, but you're so good at that, Carrie. And I mean, you're such a good role model for that because I know it. I've seen you, you can be so vulnerable and so honest about yourself and put yourself out there that I think you're able to then create that permission for other people to yeah. do the same thing um, and lead by example. And that doesn't come naturally. And and you're a, you're a gifted leader where that comes from. And I, I, I channel you sometimes when I have to be honest and vulnerable like that, like, all right, I'm going to channel my inner carry and I'm just going to put it right on out there. So I say, keep telling your story and leading that by example, because there's not a lot of great examples out there no. of leaders doing that. And, and, and you're definitely one of them. Well, life is messy. People are messy, right? All the rest of business, in my opinion, is super easy compared to the messiness of people, right? It's <laughs> always the people problems that get you stuck. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And so, you know, to be able to be skilled in effectively handling the messiness of people, because we all are, we all, we all have our baggage, we all have our bad days. And so, you know, how do we help people recognize like, it's okay to have a bad day, but you still got to own it. And how do we help you be able to move through it at a pace that feels authentic to you, but also doesn't have a negative effect on the team. And I think you're right. I think modeling flawed leadership is really an important thing to do. In fact, that's my TED talk that I'm working on. I don't know when I'm going to give a TED talk, but I'm going to have my talk ready. And it really is around this whole idea of embracing flawed leadership and being vulnerable and showcasing it because it does make it safe for other people to say, you know what, I have had some really bad past experiences too that have shaped me and I'm still figuring out how to work through that baggage. And, uh, and the more, t the more we can talk about that kind of stuff, not be a distraction to the business, but just really create that connection of like, Hey, we've all made mistakes. We've all screwed up. We all have done things that we're ashamed of or not proud of. And how do we talk about it so we can move through it? Man, it's important and more and more important today as we're dealing with so much mental health issues and just the messiness of life in the workplace. COVID has brought to light yeah, so well, much of that. Well, I can't wait for your TED Talk. And and I think, you know, you're, you're absolutely right and that it's not just a matter of kind of moving through it, but turning it into a positive energy, right? Like yep. if you're really feeling that negative energy in that way, that can be so strong, so such a powerful energy dynamic to come in and really flip that and say, how do we move that forward? How do we push that and use yeah. that energy in a way that yeah. moves us and our teams forward toward our goal, like harness it in that way for good. And that's what I think really good leadership can do, mm -hmm. right? Flip that energy around to the right direction, not just sort of tolerate it um, and sweep it under the rug. Yep. So, Yeah. Or expect people just to go fix their, their shit and not give them any tools to be able to go do it. Right. I mean, so many of us just don't know how to do it. The only reason that I've been able to get to where I am is that I've had a lot of help, you know, life coaching and, yeah. and therapy and all of those things that luckily, you know, I could access and I was determined to, to, to find those resources to help me. But a lot of people are too scared to even admit, like I have this stuff that's going on. 
and it has such a it does have such such an impact in the in the workplace. So, you know, that's what I really yeah. have been working on these last couple of years is how do I give my employees the tools that they need to be able to self lead through this, right? You can't expect your boss to fix it. You can't expect your employer to fix it. Like if you're looking outside yourself, then you're looking in the wrong place. It really is up to us each as individuals to to understand it so that we can show up as our best selves in our work and in our home life. But so many people just don't have the self-awareness or the ability to ask for that kind of help. Well, you know, Carrie, I heard you say on a previous podcast, because I listened to your podcast, that um, when you look at the reasons why people leave a job, um, the top like four or five reasons in it, it's never money, right? No. It's always culture. Yep. It's the it's the relationship that you have with your direct supervisor. It's the relationship that you have with your direct team. It's yep. the environment that you walk into every day, whether it's physical space or, or now remote space. It's always that feeling that you have of being heard and feeling valued and the healthy or unhealthy nature of the environment. So, yep. you know, you're, you're absolutely right. We can't solve everything for everybody, but you can set the standard and expect people to to live to that standard. Yep, totally agree. I'm doing this new uh, program. It's with another YPOer uh, who's in YPO San Francisco, and it's called uh, Positive Intelligence. It's a six week program that you go, and it really helps you understand like your inner judge, those inner voices, those inner saboteurs that derail you. That you know they, that they're doing good things for you by controlling the situation, or you know wanting to set the rules and follow them or hyper achiever, hyper rational. And it's so powerful. I want to have all of my executive management team go through it. I'm going through two of it with two of my people on my team right now as a pilot. And it's so interesting. And I want every one of my employees to go through it because boy, if you have the understanding of like, man, these are the three things that really trip me up and make me start judging myself, judging other people and judging the situations. Like you can empower, we can mobilize so many people with just a little bit deeper understanding. And I never like had a, a way to think like, how do I do this at scale with my employees? But there's right. so many of these tools that are coming out there that it's like, you could actually really scale this and, and, and give people that self work toolkit to be able to take the next step wherever they are on their journey of self-awareness and self-actualization. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, I think any tools to help people kind of shine a light on why do I think this way? Even those first, first thoughts about it of saying, wait, where does this come from in my history and in my past? And then once you shine a light on it, then that's when you can really start making progress, right? Yep. And totally. moving forward. Well, yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Can't wait for that. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit more about Mazda Fiato. So what is your mission and your vision as a company? Where do you want this all to go? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, our vision really is to reconnect people with what's beautiful yeah. and, and create a beautiful experience in this, in this industry. I mean, we we're selling on e-commerce right now. Um, and we're selling only in the U S this is our starting place. So we want to expand into other countries to sell into other countries. We want to expand into where we're selling. We might potentially look into physical retail going forward. I mean, we definitely want to take a big bite out of the industry and to compete with the big retailers in this space. Uh, we'll never be as big as they are because we're going to hold true to Italian heritage and style and performance. And But even in that space, we can continue to grow our brands and continue to grow our market share. One thing I'll note that we've learned in this company that's been so interesting to me is that half of our customers are men. Day in and day out, half of our customers are men. And I thought that they might be 20% of our customer base. And what I'm finding is that men don't have a great place to go to buy their products. They don't have a great place to go to really get high quality, high style, whether it's skincare, hair care, body, all of those types of things. So we're finding a great audience in men, and I really want to explore that and become a premier place for men to shop for all of their beauty needs. Women are used to going to a lot of places and, and going through a million different products and brands and finding what's right for them. Men really aren't, but they're interested and they want good products. So 
um, that's an area where I feel like we can really compete um, and differentiate ourselves going forward. So, you know, we are one year old right now, this month. So taking all the lessons we've learned in the first year and really figuring out where we can grow from here is the name of the game right now. So that's really our mission. And, and our mission too is just to support these amazing Italian family businesses. I've made so many friends and great relationships over this last year with these families. They're such interesting, creative, amazing people that I just am really motivated to support them and help them grow and grow their businesses and find new audiences um, for them in the U.S. and other places. So they're really motivating to me, the companies we represent. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. And how about the challenges of e-commerce, right? So e-commerce, I'm sure, is brand new to you. <laughs> so how are yeah. you overcoming the challenges of a truly different business model than what your background has given you the opportunity to explore? Yeah, it's definitely all new. I mean, it's and it's absolutely no hiding from anything on, on e-commerce. You can measure just about everything. Everything is in the numbers, the dashboards. You know where people are coming from, what's working and what's not working, which is honestly really refreshing because the numbers are always telling you stories. The data is always telling you a story. It's trying to figure out what story is the data telling you on any given day and getting better and better at that going forward. But e-commerce also moves at a really fast pace because Google will change, Facebook will change, all the different platforms that you rely on, even Shopify will change. So I'm learning quickly that, you know, I personally can't be an expert at every platform and every application and everything that's going on. I'm getting better all the time at finding the people who are. I think that was a mistake that I made starting out is that you move at such a frenetic pace in the first few months of starting up a new company. And especially you've got product flying in from all over the place. You're trying to sell it on e-commerce, trying to advertise. You're trying to do everything all the time that I was hiring people, hiring companies, pulling in help just wherever I could out of almost just panic. Once I realized, oh, we need to be doing that. You guys can do it. Okay. Can you start today? And getting them going, right? And then realizing after a few months, I'm really overpaying for that. Or I can do that myself. I just didn't know how, but now we know how. Or those people were available to start because they weren't actually that good. I need to go find somebody who's really good at this. So getting better on all of those things every day. And, and I think now I'm realizing... Um, what I have to do is not necessarily slow the pace, but it's okay to take an extra day to research it, to call a few more references, to figure out what are really the price points so that we don't make costly mistakes. Yeah. We're still going to make mistakes all the time, but I'm learning how to make them less damaging if we do make them. Um, and that's what e-commerce is. The pace is just insane. And it's 24 hours a day, right? There's never a time when it's not happening, when it's not working. Um, so it really is just getting smart as fast as you can and minimizing the mistakes. And so talking about the leadership or, you know, developing your leadership team and developing, growing your team through this, is it a lot different for you now in a startup than it was for you at CSU? Yeah, it's really very different because, yeah. you know, here we're so small we don't need a lot of full-time people, right? I need, I need a half a CFO. I need a, a half of a marketing team. I need, I need a controller a few hours a month, right? And, and before, it's just hiring full-time people to do full-time jobs all the time. And now I've got my full-time small team here with me, but everybody else is on contract, Mm -hmm. So, you know, our warehouse is on contract, the marketing team's on contract. It's, it's this, the web development team is this whole constellation of people who are there when I need them, but I am not their only employer, right? So for me, it's as we grow, figuring out the tipping point at which it no longer makes sense to have that person on contract and I need a full-time in-house person. Right. So growing in all of these places where I'm like, all right, I need just an eighth. Now I need a quarter. Now I need a half. Now I really need a CFO. Right. And then being really careful about bringing in full time people 
at CSU, it was just the opposite of that. You're always hiring full-time people and there's always people doing full-time jobs. And once in a while you'd hire someone on contract or a piece of somebody, but it was not the norm. And now it's just the opposite. Yeah. So it's a very different way of doing business. And with COVID too, it's really enabled everybody to work remotely. So everybody is working remotely. Our entire team is scattered about all over the world and it works because people got used to it very quickly. Um, and now it's much more the norm. Yeah, absolutely. I just had this conversation with my husband. We're hiring for his business, a uh, IT managed services company. And he's like, this is so expensive. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but you need it. And he was like, it's, it's a lot different when it's our money. You have a big budget for this stuff at Stone Age. Like, you know, this is really expensive for us. And I thought, you know, it's so interesting to have that, that different perspective of when you do have bigger budgets and you don't have to mm -hmm. scrutinize things so hard. And right now you're just in a, every dollar that you spend really matters to say, how am I going to invest this to really grow the business? So I can imagine it's a whole different way to look at things. Yeah, it's a whole different way of looking at things. And, and too, I mean, not that we necessarily tolerated mediocrity in my previous job, but now you cannot tolerate no. it. Every dollar is so yeah. important. And so you have to hire the best person you can for the budget that you have a hundred percent. And if that person just isn't performing or that company, that contract is not performing, you can't afford to keep them. Yep. You have to go with the next one that's going to perform. There's just, there's no option to tolerate mediocre performance in this job. It'll sink you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that has to feel like a lot of pressure, right? So how do you handle that pressure and how are you taking care of yourself? You know, Carrie, you know me, that doesn't come naturally <laughs> to take care of myself. And, and, it, and it never did, especially now that you're in a startup and I do work seven days a week, to be honest. I mean, um, that's just sort of what it, what it calls for right now. But, um, you know, when I start to feel feel that kind of energy coming in where it feels more like panic. And I'm sitting here on a Saturday morning feeling, you know, like I just don't know what to do next. Like it's so overwhelming. What I do is really try to take that energy and harness it and say, okay, if that's where my energy is going, I'm pulling the company downward in that direction with it. I've got to take that powerful energy and move it in the right direction and just let it go. And that sort of intellectual knowledge of worry and panic and all of that is just not doing anybody any good and harnessing that for good. It's not, it's not easy. You have to force yourself into a different mental state. You really have to get your energy right. So there's that. And, you know, it helps that my business is, is beauty products and bath products. So I take a bath every night and I call it product testing. And I get in there with all the things and say it's work, but it's also caring for myself at the same time so I can justify it. So I definitely indulge in that. I love <laughs> that. that. I love that. <laughs> well, good. Well, I'm glad you're finding at least a few moments a day to be able to product test and relax. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we're going to wrap up here. So I do have a couple of uh, last questions that I'd like to ask you. So the name of this podcast is Reflect Forward, which as you know, has lots of meanings to me. What does Reflect Forward mean to you? Such a great name, Carrie, for a podcast. I love it. Um, you know, I think the key word is reflect. I mean, you know, reflect can be at the end of the day, reflecting on what happened today? How did that happen? What went well? What didn't go well? And then using that to push you forward, right? Into your next day. Reflection can also have, I think, a negative connotation as well. If you're reflecting too much on your past and too much on maybe negative feelings or things that have kept you from succeeding in the past, negative mindsets. I think when you get into that kind of reflection, then it's really important to drop it and move forward quickly. So the operative word I think is forward and keeping reflection to a healthy reflection and not allowing the reflection to keep you stuck in a place that prevents you from actually moving forward with the energy that you really need. So that's what it means to me. I don't know. I think you probably taught me that actually 
carry somewhere along the way. But Yeah, that's a beautiful answer. And I agree with you completely. Life is going forward no matter what. So being stuck in the past, you not being able to say, this is why it happened. Here's what I'm going to do something. Here's what I'm going to do differently to change it. Life's going to go forward without you. So that's why I think it is so important to be able to let it go and say, this is what I'm going to create, right? Your past does not have to define who you are in the future. It can certainly shape it, but it doesn't have to define you. Right. I am walking, living proof of that. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. you are. It's inspiring. Well, thank you. All right. And finally, if you had one piece of advice for leaders who want to be exceptional at what they do, what would it be? I feel like we're on the theme here today, Carrie, but I would have to say that you have to get your energy right. That if you have energy that is stuck, stuck in the past, stuck in whatever way on the loops that you have in your past, you're leaving so much energy behind that you're not going to have enough to be exceptional. I think that you have to have all your ammunition, all your energy focused in the right place if you're going to succeed, if you're going to be exceptional. And that means sort of brutally letting go of all the places where your energy and your negative energy can still be stuck because you're not going to be exceptional unless you can leave it behind and actually aim it going forward. So I would say you, you got to get your energy right. Take it seriously. I love it. That's a fantastic answer. I think that's my favorite one so far. I doubt <laughs> that, but thank you. <laughs> oh no, it's so true. It's so true. I think a lot of people are not aware of not just what that energy does to them, but everyone else around them, especially leadership, right? People are always watching you trying to analyze what is, what is she trying to say? What does that look mean? Why is she in a bad mood? Why is her energy down? Why did she use that word? And so, mm -hmm. you know, it really is important to be mindful and intentional about, about where you put your energy, how you're showing up every day and how that's being perceived by everybody else around you. So I think it's a brilliant answer. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, do you have any news or promotional, anything that you want to share with us about things you've got going on? Oh, man. Um, well, we just launched subscription boxes. That's new. We've never yeah. done that before. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that goes. You know, we have a thousand products on our website. And what I've learned is that people really want us to do some of the work of curating the products for them. So we are in the process right now of actually putting together new bundles for the holidays. So you can get the bundle that is the Italian gentleman or the Italian spa package and, and actually let us put in the box for you all these different brands and products so you can find your favorites. And, and yeah, subscription boxes, we just launched them, four new subscription boxes so you can get a seasonal delivery. We can only handle four a year. We can't do them every month, but we're doing seasonal subscription boxes so you can get something delivered to your door that's seasonal all year long. So we just launched those. We'll see. Hopefully they'll sell through the holiday season, but we're excited to give it a try. That's awesome. I can't tell you how much I look forward to my Nordstrom's uh, trunk every month. Yeah. So I think it's a brilliant idea. I'm going to go check them out mm -hmm. afterwards because it's like you get a present in the mail. Every quarter. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And we, and we do the work of saying, we think you're going to huh. love these brands. Try them out. Yeah. And then, you know, right? And then you find your favorites and come back. So we made, we made one for men, one for home, and two for women at different price points. So that's what we're going to try out. They're out there now. I just went live. Wonderful. Okay. And how can people find you? Give us your website. Yeah, best place to go is mozzafiato.com, M-O-Z-Z-A-F-I-A-T-O. Mozzafiato is actually a big Italian word that means breathtaking. So that's what we hope people will think when they come to our website and experience our products. So come visit us at mozzafiato.com and then our social handles um, on Facebook and Instagram are I am mozzafiato. I love it. I will share all of that in the show notes as well. And how can people find you? Well, I'm super easy to find. You can find me on LinkedIn, connect on me with there. I connect with a lot of people on LinkedIn and my email is just amy at mozzafiato.com. Wonderful. Well, this has been such a fun interview and thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey. I'm so excited for you and I can't wait for this just to brand to explode. I, I, I fully believe that you're going to make it happen. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks for inviting me. It's always a yes when you ask me to do literally anything. So I appreciate you having me on your awesome show. It's been great. 
Wonderful, wonderful. All right, everyone, hang tight and I'll be right back. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that interview and saw just truly what a remarkable person Amy is. Be sure to check out her website and order products. I think the new subscription bundles are going to be super fun. And and let me know what you think. With that, I will leave you and I look forward to hosting you on next week's episode of Reflect Forward. Have a great day. Oh, yeah. And if you like this podcast, please like, subscribe, share, rate, write a review. I always appreciate it. Take care.